Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, and this is the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a significant effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Carl Woese. Dr. Woese died recently at the age of 84, and he was perhaps the most important evolutionary biologist of the 20th century. Let's begin by setting the stage so we can put Dr. Woese's work into context. For centuries, people classified living things as either animals or plants based on how they looked. That was the way it was until the middle of the 17th century when von Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope and saw bacteria. No one knew how to classify bacteria until the middle of the 19th century when they were given their own classification along with animals and plants. In the 20th century, when the electron microscope was invented, scientists could finally see subcellular structures like the nucleus and things in the cytoplasm like ribosomes where proteins were created, and scientists began classifying organisms based on what these subcellular structures did. In the early 1950s, when Watson and Crick discovered DNA, it opened up the fields of genetics and genetic sequencing, and this permitted another way of classifying living organisms. And this is where Carl Woese enters the stage. He was doing his research at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, not too far from where I'm broadcasting right now, and he started looking at things like the genetic sequencing of bacteria, focusing in on the ribosomes, and the evolutionary relationship between different types of known bacteria. And what he discovered was that you could classify organisms not simply by looking at them, but by the type of proteins and the genetic sequencing they had. In the course of his work, he did something groundbreaking. He discovered a completely new form of life. He discovered a family of bacteria known as archaea, which is Greek for ancient. They were ancient microorganisms, essentially the earliest life forms on Earth. Here's a brief report on Carl Woese from the University of Illinois. Carl Woese earned a Ph.D. in biophysics from Yale in 1953. He conducted research at Yale until taking subsequent positions at General Electric Research Laboratory and at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Woese came to the University of Illinois in 1964. At Illinois, he focuses on genomic analysis, Specifically, he concentrates on how genomic analysis relates to evolutionary theory in horizontal gene transfer. In 1977, he revolutionized molecular biology when he announced that life came in three forms, not two. Previously, it was thought that the tree of life consisted of two main branches, bacteria and everything else. Woese discovered the third branch, which he named archaea. The 2003 Crawford Prize in Biosciences given by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and was awarded the University of Illinois' highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medallion, in 2009. Archaea were once thought to live only in extreme environments like the Arctic and in volcanic lakes at the bottom of oceans, but it's now realized that they're ubiquitous. They're in virtually every climate, in rivers, in lakes, in soils, and even in the human body. And like a lot of groundbreaking discoveries, Carl Woese's discovery was thought to be heresy for about 20 years. Scientists actually argued that there was not a distinct older form of bacteria. But by the 1990s, archaea were accepted and were published in every biology textbook. And in fact, one of the first major distinctions that Dr. Woese won was the Van Leeuwenhoek Medal given by the Netherlands. So things came full circle when he won the medal that was named after the discoverer of the microscope and the first man to actually see microorganisms. The functions of archaea are still being studied. They metabolize differently than other bacteria, and they're thought to regulate in some ways the concentration of methane, carbon, and nitrogen in our atmosphere. Since they are considered to be the oldest living evolutionary life form, they may provide a clue to whether there's life in outer space. So Carl Woese's work may actually provide a hint to whether there is, in fact, extraterrestrial life. Carl Woese wasn't a household name, but just to let you know how important he was, a colleague from the University of Colorado said in the journal New Science in 2010, I think Woese has done more for biology writ large than any biologist in history, including Charles Darwin. Pretty high praise, and let's face it, you don't run into people who've discovered new life forms every day. Well, we move on from Carl Woese to Claude Nobbs. Claude Nobbs died recently at the age of 77, and we include him in this program because when someone gets mentioned in an iconic song, 
it's sort of imperative that we have to put him in and tell who he was. The song was Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple. In 1967, Claude Nobbs founded the Montreux Jazz Festival in Montreux, Switzerland. And it was a well-known popular jazz festival that expanded to rock and roll, got all sorts of people from Ella Fitzgerald to Bob Dylan to Radiohead at it. Because my father thought I was too lazy at school, so I decided to be a cook. But I wanted to be actually a musician. Good evening. Sit back, relax, and make yourself comfortable to enjoy an evening with Jess Rupert! In 1971, in a casino in Montreux, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention were performing, and a fire broke out at the casino, and smoke engulfed the entire area. I'm going to let leader of the group Deep Purple at the time, Ian Gillen, tell the story of smoke on the water, which referred to smoke over Lake Geneva. That's Lake Geneva in Switzerland, not in Wisconsin, for you Midwesterners. We all came out to Montreux on the Lake Geneva shoreline to make records with the mobile. We didn't have much time, as it said in the lyrics. We it tells the story of the making of the album Machine Head in November 1971. We were there to record in the casino, and Frank Zappel was playing there with the Mothers of Invention. And halfway through the show, somebody came in right over my shoulder and shot a flare gun into the wall. Pretty rapidly, the place was filled with smoke, and Frank made announcements from the stage, got everyone out, and Claude rushed in shouting, get out, get out. And he, he went into the, to the underground kitchen to help some kids out who had become trapped in there. Hence the line, Funky Claude, uh, pulling kids out of the ground. Claude became Funky Claude from then on. He's been known as that and uh, been a friend for life, really. And that song, of course, became one of the iconic songs of the rock and roll era. We talked about it before when we talked about Jim Marshall and his amplifiers. And we talked about Big Jim Sullivan, who taught a lot of his bass technique to Richie Blackmore. Well, George Gershwin and Cole Porter like to put specific people into their songs. Layla is, of course, about Patty Boyd. And the members of Deep Purple put Claude Knobs into their song. Take a brief listen to a little bit of Smoke on the Water, and you'll hear them sing about Funky Claude, who was trying to rescue people. <laughs> Claude Nobbs is immortalized forever with his efforts to evacuate the casino in the song Smoke on the Water. We're going to close tonight with Sal Yurik, who was a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx who died recently at the age of 88. Sal Yurik was a number of different things during his life, including a social worker and an SDS radical, but he was most known because he was a novelist. He wrote a number of well-acclaimed books, but a book that he didn't even feel was his best is definitely his most famous. That's because 14 years after he wrote the book, it was made into one of the iconic movies of the second half of the 20th century. The book is The Warriors. It was not uncommon in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when Sal Yurk was growing up for there to be comic book treatments of classical themes. And in fact, that's what The Warriors is. It's a comic book treatment of the classical theme of Anabasis, which is a story by Xenophon, the Greek historian and mercenary, who went along with 10,000 Greek troops to Persia. They were there at the behest of the Persian leader Cyrus, who was attempting to wrest the throne from his brother. During the fighting between the Persians and the Greeks, Cyrus was killed. The Greek warriors had to make their way back from Persia to Greece and Anabasis, and Xenophon chronicled the hazardous trip that they made to return to their homeland. The historian Will Durant called it one of the great adventures in human history, and it's been referred to many times, including by James Joyce and Jules Verne. Sal Yurik took it as the subject of his book, A Boy Reading a Comic Book that Tells the Story of a Brooklyn Gang. Yurik has taken the ancient Greek story and transposed it to the late 20th century United States, and all the issues of bravery, loyalty, and fear 
The Greek soldiers have now become the warriors, a South Brooklyn gang that must travel to the North Bronx about 25 miles. They're there for a huge gang meeting led by a gang member named Cyrus. After Cyrus is killed, they must make their way back from the Bronx through Manhattan to the safety of South Brooklyn with every gang in the city out to kill them because they mistakenly think that it was the Warriors who killed Cyrus. It's one of director Walter Hill's first movies. It's his best movie, and he does a great job of portraying the street gang members. The movie had a reputation of being a violent, dangerous movie, and a lot of people stayed away from it until it was given a wonderful review by Paul and Kale, the best movie reviewer in America who worked for the New Yorker magazine at the time. People started to see it and realize that it wasn't the violent, dangerous movie they believed, but an actual work of art. Here is the trailer for the 1979 Warriors, based on the book by Sal Urich. I loved this movie when I first saw it in the theaters. I saw it with about five people. As you'll hear, one of the highlights is the techno pop score they used by Barry DeVarzon. <laughs> Are the armies of the night. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? The Furies. The Boppers. The Hi Hats. The Lizzies. The Turnbull ACs. The Gramercy Riffs. Riff. And these are the Warriors. We know about the Warriors. They're a heavy outfit. They're from Coney Island. Warriors? You guys are the big dudes, huh? Now, they're in the Bronx. We're going back. 27 miles behind enemy lines. It's the only choice we've got. Between them and safety, stand 20,000 cops. <laughs> and 100,000 sworn enemies. I want them all. I want all the yeah, All those gangs had distinct colors and distinct uniforms. It was really neat. Yeah, trust me when I tell you that was good stuff. In fact, one of the highlights of the movie is near the end when an actor named David Patrick Kelly, who plays Luther, the man who really shot Cyrus, comes with his gang to get the Warriors, and they see him in an old car and they hear a clicking sound. That clicking sound turns out to be small beer bottles that he's placed on his fingers, clicking them together, daring the warriors to come out in a final confrontation. This is one of the great 70s movie scenes with one of the great 70s movie psychos. Warriors, come out to play. Warriors, come out to play. gets his at the end. He's got the same long stringy blonde hair as one of my other favorite 70s movie psycho, Scorpio from Dirty Harry, played by Andy Robinson. Of course, we can't forget Robert De Niro as Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver when we're talking great 70s movie psychos. Anyway, at the end of the movie, you see a great scene of the warriors walking on the beach after they've made it back all the way. You've got a Coney Island boardwalk with the Atlantic Ocean in the background. And the soundtrack concludes with an iconic song by Joe Walsh, who had been with the Eagles, before going solo. is recognized justifiably as a classic. They tell me it's been made into a very popular video game. I don't know too much about that kind of stuff, but they tell me that it's very popular. And we have Saul Yurik to thank for all of that. I want to close on that note, and I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. As a final tribute to Saul Yurik, I want to play a song from the Warriors. One of the conceits the movies used was that as the Warriors moved back down from Bronx to Brooklyn, they were threatened by an ominous DJ 
who over the radio would relay messages from the gangs to the warriors. The DJ was played by Lynn Thigpen. Lynn Thigpen had a great voice, and all you ever saw in the movie were her sensuous lips and the microphone she was talking into to broadcast over the radio as she relayed the messages. When the warriors were about halfway home, she relayed a threat with a great song. Unfortunately, the movie didn't use the original. They probably couldn't get the rights to it, but since we're only playing 30 seconds of it, we're going to play the original. We're going to merge it with her intro from the movie. Here is the 1965 version, the real version, of Nowhere to Run by Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Introduced by Lynn Thigpen in Sal Yurik's The Warriors. All right, now. For all you bumpers out there in the big city, all you street people with an ear for the action, I've been asked to relay a request from the Gramercy Ritz. It's a special for the Warriors. That's that real live bunch from Coney. And I do mean the Warriors. Here's a hit with them in mind. Take me to leave. 